Hi right, guys, welcome back. This is episode 116, featuring the second part of my interview with Chris Taylor, the creator of Dungeon Siege and Total Annihilation, which are also the two games we're going to focus on in this segment. <laughs> Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Chris Taylor. All right, so 1997. Uh, it's when you joined Cave Dog Entertainment. You finally got to make Total Annihilation, correct? So, <laughs> uh, what's the story? How did you get into? How did you maneuver into a position where you were finally able to make the game that you'd been wanting to make for so long? Well, this is going to be a theme here. Uh, very lucky. I'm a very lucky guy. See, because when I was doing Hardball Two, there was a producer at Accolade. Her name was Shelley Day, and Shelley left Accolade, and and I stayed in touch with her. I was really big on staying in touch with people, networking. You know, I knew that you it's 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 being able to pick up the phone and call someone was important. So when she left, she went to she went to Taito, then she went over to LucasArts, she met Ron Gilbert, and her and Ron decided to start this kids company in Woodenville, which is where I'm I live now. Um uh, to, to start this kids game company. So they start the company. They've got a game out. Putt Putt uh, saves the zoo, I believe, or joins the parade or saves the zoo. One of these early games. And I call her up on the phone and I say, hey, I, I'm, I'm thinking of leaving Electronic Arts and I want to start my own game company. So she says, well, I'm going to put you in touch with Ron. And so Ron and I talk and Ron says, look, what do you, what do you really want to do? Um, you don't just want to do... Um, uh, pick up or ports, conversions, and things like that. You want, What do you want to do? And I said, oh, I'd love to make a game like Command & Conquer. I said, the Command & Conquer is so awesome. It has so much potential. Uh, it's it's just, just an amazing style of game, really, what we then, what then became real-time strategy. Then I don't even think it had a name. And um, <clears throat> so he said, well, why don't you come on down and join Humongous? and um, build the game. And I was like, okay. So of course uh, I did, and I was an employee. And Ron gave me unprecedented creative freedom. And I tell you what, not only was it unprecedented then, it's unprecedented now. I mean, people don't get that kind of freedom to make the games. I mean, you have marketing and you have executive management. You have all sorts of people who participate in the overall vision of a, of a design, um, picking and choosing things they like, asking to take out things they don't like, whatever. Uh, but he gave me this incredible freedom. And so uh, when the game was being built, if he didn't quite understand what, why I liked some part of the game, why I wanted it to do a certain thing. He said, look, it's, I, I may disagree, but it's your call. You do what you like. You're the creative guy. So Ron was amazing. Ron gave me that, um, that creative freedom. And uh, the game, I'm sure when people played it, they were like, this is really crazy. Like, you can't do this, right? No, who would allow someone to, to do this? Uh, it's what happens when creativity and um, uh, you know it runs wild and nothing stops it. Uh, that's what I think is going to be happening more and more these days with the with what's happened on um, you know with the iPhone and with with Facebook and, and web apps like Minecraft. We it actually took twenty well it's been fifteen years but it took fifteen years for that to really happen again and i don't think anybody believed it was going to happen again so i know i'm jumping ahead chronologically here um but uh back then certainly um it was rare and uh it has been rare for the last 15 years now was it your idea to have the the elevations and have having the elevation of the land affect troop movement yeah, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of this, the, of Total Annihilation, Dungeon Siege, Supreme Commander, that is not me, right? Like, I am not every creative idea. Uh, that particular idea, though, of an elevated battlefield was was my idea. But my, my idea started with the idea of building a 3D battlefield. See, because I was playing Command and Conquer, and the, and the little units were were pre-rendered, so they kind of, they didn't have that fluidity 
to them that I knew a 3D object would 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 provide. But more than that, I was such a a, a nut about military uh, weapons and the Abrams tank. I knew that they could move and shoot at the same time. And when they when the when the tank is moving, the barrel like the tank is moving underneath, but the barrel would stay still because of all the sophisticated computer compensation systems. So I said, "Look, we're a computer game. We can do that better than anything in real life." And um, if you have high ground, you can shoot a projectile, artillery round, or, or what have you, um, much further than you can if you're in the low ground position, which would bring strategy and tactics to the game in a way that's not just a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight where you mash it out based on if I have 10 and you have 10, um, we cancel each other out. Rather, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if you had 5 and I had 10, but you could still beat me because you could use tactics? And you could rally around my units, and you could shoot and move, and you could out 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 game me. Um, that was a really important part of it, and elevation was 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 key to that. Now, have you spent a lot of time playing games with miniatures, like Warhammer, and so on? I, you know, it's funny. I was um, I, I dabbled a little in Dungeons and Dragons, but I'll be honest with you, they didn't have the attention span for the rules. Um, uh, I played a lot of Risk, um, but when I got when I really was in that age group, when I was in the gay, young gaming age group, I got my hands on computers. And so I was playing on, on a computer. And the early question you asked me was, uh, what games did I play and stuff? I mean, I went all the way from those arcade games up through the Commodore 64 at a friend's house playing all the, you know, impossible mission. Remember, how did that one go? Uh, Destroy him, my robots. Remember that line? It was so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we played every single game. I think he, I think my friend pirated like every single Commodore 64 game. I don't think he bought a single one. It was such a crime. I, however, bought my games on the TRS-80 because there was no pirate community. <laughs> so I had to actually spend real money on my games. Uh, you know, and there were there were a whole ton of great games. I bought every game Radio Shack sold. Because remember, Radio Shack is what made this computer, which is so weird to think about today. Radio Shack, which sells, you know, batteries and... Uh, and you know, whatever remote control cars. What does Radio Shack sell? I don't know. <laughs> so the, the the point is that I I play games. I wasn't into board games and miniatures so much because I had this computer, and that was rare for a kid to have his own computer. So um, that's where I spent most of my time. All right. So moving on then to uh, Dungeon Siege. I just uh, you know. I <laughs> got a couple of copies here. Uh, one of my, uh, you know, as I said, one of my favorites. You know, it seems like a lot of, you know, I was looking at some of the contemporary re uh, reviews too, and they were very positive. You know, what is it about this game you think that uh, made it so successful? Well, you know, I, I see something today, uh, a pattern in games that if you can do something fresh, something that people don't feel they haven't been there before. But it plays well, like it just it's smooth. It does what you want it to do when you click. There's some new ideas that um, like we brought the continuous world, no loading screen, um, which was an enormous amount of engineering work, um, arguably too much. I meaning we shouldn't have done it. Uh, it came at too high a price. Um, we had the pack mule. Uh, multi-character party uh, in a way that felt more like an RTS game than it felt like a traditional um, uh, RPG. Like if you looked at Baldur's Gate or um, what was one before that? Uh, or was it after that? Uh, yeah, and Neverwinter Nights. Well, so Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter Nights. They were much more of an, ad an adaption. Excellent games, but an adaption of the pen and paper games brought to a computer or what I did is I took RTS sensibility and I brought that to action to the RPGs making that action RPG um, even more light uh, light just a lighter a lighter experience um, uh, Diablo was of course the the, the, uh, the gold standard and Diablo was uh, still a little a, a little mechanical and a little bit um, it had something to it that was awesome, and it sold. I mean, these games all sold so much more than Dungeon Siege. I mean, 
that must be said, right? That we never achieved the sales of any of these other games. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can tell you we had a lot of fun making them. So, hey, that part was good, right? But um, uh, it was just, it was trying to do something different. And I think the people who did enjoy it and who, who, who you know, the million or so people that bought a copy, uh, they felt that come through, that it was different, that we weren't just trying to throw a paint job on somebody else's game, which I... I refuse to do that. Um, even if I was told to do that, I would end up not doing that uh, just because I, it's just too hard. It's just, it's too, uh, it's just the, the, the artistic integrity has to be there. You can't abandon that. Well, it's a beautiful game, but you know, what really stands out to me, <laughs> to say, one of my favorite parts of the game is the mule. Yeah. <laughs> First time I saw that, I just cracked up. I mean, well, that, that was such a great idea. Uh, I'm sort of wondering, what's the story behind uh, the mule? Was that just an idea that occurred uh, to you one day, or, or how did the how did it get there? <laughs> well, I you know I was frustrated because my inventory was always full playing Diablo, and I spent all of my time going back and forth to town. So I said, I just need a bigger inventory. But I said, you know, if I have a multi-character party and I sacrifice a fighting character. Uh, for storage, that's a good trade-off. So that's where the pack mule idea came from. Frustrated with uh, with the with Diablo's, uh, and what made it really exas what exacerbated the problem in Diablo was the slow, excuse me, the slow loading time. So it was like it was bad enough. I had to go back and forth to town, but it was that I had to sit and look at a loading screen. So uh, that's where the pack mule came from. I think it was a Dungeon Siege 2 where the uh, pack mule becomes a fightable fighting uh, character. Um, the, you know, I don't, I don't remember. Well, I know the pack mule would fight in Dungeon Siege 1. How he would fight in Dungeon Siege 1 as but well. But you couldn't, I don't know if you could tell him to fight. I can't remember. You know, gosh. I can't remember whether you could tell him to fight or he'd only fight if he was attacked. Um, which... You know, sometimes came in handy. You'd be, all everybody would be unconscious, unconscious, and the pack mule would be the only one left, and he'd be kicking away, and you'd be like, "Go, pack mule, go!" <laughs> and every once in a while, I've been there. <laughs> he'd come through, or she, as it may be, and um, save the day. And you'd be like, "Okay, that was great. That was one of those. those that was one of those." Um, emergent behaviors right because when we designed it we couldn't have sat down there you know and the design document said and every once in a while the pack mule is going to save the whole party um so that's just a pure emergent emergent thing and it was cool i noticed in some other or some interviews you did about dungeon siege you, you said they you thought the game was too big and that actually had a negative impact on the sales remember that yeah um but at the time, Baldur's Gate was like 100 hours or something. I forget the enormity of that game. So we thought we had to compete with it, which was just silly. It was silly. So we were shooting for 100, and we ended up getting to 50 or 60. And what we failed to really understand is the economics of game development. That, you know, our budget was, it was okay, but it was not the budget of our, of our, the, of the products that we were competing against. So uh, what happens is the quality of the experience gets thin and you start to phone it in a little bit on some of the levels because there's just not enough time to do it right. So we should have made a shorter game. You know, 35 hours on Dungeons Each One probably would have been great. Had people get through the game and say, okay, I'm done, had a great time. And now I'm ready to go to the next one. And then in Dungeon Teach 2, we made the mistake again. And it was still huge. And it was too long. And, you know, that's the kind of experience that you you shouldn't have to get by doing it. Like, you should be able to read that in a book. Because it's just, that's way too many years of your life. I mean, that's like seven years for those two games to learn those valuable lessons. Um, now, a, now, what, a six, seven, eight-hour shooter? is not uncommon it seems like the gamers from my generation though are usually complaining about i wish it was longer um 
you know, it's it's. I find that a little hard to believe because I'm from the generation. And I'm so busy. Uh, I'm finding myself enjoying these really, really short games because I can get all the way through them. Like, I love playing Portal 2 for, like, three nights, and I was able to finish it. And then I was like, okay, done. I'm done. Check that off the list. I, if I was going on for weeks and weeks, I'd be like, oh, shit. I got to... The rest of my life is waiting for me to go live. I can't, I gotta get through this game, you know? It's like, uh, so I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think that it's, it'd be, it'd be, it might be tied to the notion that if you only get one every four years, it's gotta be long. But these days, there's a great game coming out every two weeks. So um, I can live with this, these much shorter times. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a third and final part of this interview with Mr. Chris Taylor. He's been a lot, as you can see, it's a lot of fun interviewing him. He's got a lot of personality, so you want to stay tuned uh, for that. And then I'll follow up with a another retrospective, probably of an Elder Scrolls game. Uh, my friend, uh, new friend Casey Heisman, uh, sent me this box copy of the Elder Scrolls Adventures Red Guard, which is fairly rare. You know, at least I don't really hear much about that game. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm not really familiar with the Elder Scrolls. I've played uh, Oblivion and Morrowind. So I'm, I want to ask you, which of the Elder Scrolls games would you most like to see featured in a retrospective? So sound off in the comments and I'll, I'll listen to you. And, and uh, whoever makes the best case, I'll <laughs> probably cover that. I'll follow their advice. So anyway, stay tuned for that. And uh, Casey also sent me something else. Uh, this bottle of Shipyard... Pumpkinhead L. This is brewed in Portland, Maine, and I uh, took the liberty of filling up the old drinking horn with it, so let's give it a, an on-air sample. Uh, oh, I like that. You know, you can, you can definitely taste the pumpkin in this. Uh, that's actually quite good. That, that pumpkin is really... I didn't think I would like that, but actually I do. <laughs> I actually really like that, a sort of pumpkin aftertaste you get with this. I'll uh, finish that off when I'm uh, done here. But anyway, I have a, gro a great quotation. <laughs> Maybe that pumpkin's uh, getting to me already. Okay, let me wrap this up before it finishes me off. This is a quotation. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I think you'll get a real kick out of it once you've uh, heard the quotation. And it goes something like this. I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality that it should have. Spoken by Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> See you guys next week. Matt. Matt, listen to me. You can't throw your life away like this.